What is that? What'd you hear? What's out there? Don't lick the lens. Got too close. That was risky. Almost got the lens licked. Hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great. When I was working on the garden tour just a week or two ago, I realized during that video that I have these two tree ferns here that needed a little bit of TLC, mostly just some pruning, and also that these were two plants that I hadn't talked much about since I got them. And when I got them, I unboxed these plants from, uh, where was it, Hertz, I believe, and uh, said that I would give updates on how they're doing, and I don't, I don't think that ever happened. So here we are, about, I don't know, eight to ten months later, whenever I got these. I'm not going to call this a care video. We'll call it a spotlight video. That's largely because I don't like to talk about the care of a plant unless I've had it for about a full year. I like to go through all four seasons with them. I haven't been there with this one yet. However, I've gotten a taste of its winter care, its summer care when I have it outdoors. And we can talk about what I plan on doing with it in the fall, but there isn't really much to say there. I'm just going to take them inside. But overall, I just I wanted to give that update. So you can have a look, see how they're doing, talk about the silver lady fern or the dwarf tree fern and uh, why they're so awesome. This is a plant that I've really, really grown to enjoy and I'm really glad that I got these. Hey, for starters, should probably just go over like the general, like what the heck is this thing? What, what are we looking at here? These are the Blechnum gibbum, which is the silver lady fern, some called a dwarf tree fern, silver lady tree fern. It's important to put that word tree in there because there is another fern that is called the silver lady fern. I was going to say similar to like the Australian tree fern or something like that, but really they're not with the exception of the fact they grow a trunk. And that seems to be about it. My experience growing these is that these have been much, much, much easier to grow and they have different physical characteristics just looking at their fronds. They don't look the same either, but they do both have trunks. They have some of that trichome hairy stuff going on along the fronds otherwise that's that's probably about it side of just the common things that they have together with both being ferns meaning that they're going to like a good amount of moisture fast draining soil that does hold on to some of that moisture don't want to dry out too quickly a good amount of humidity in the air i would say at least 40 percent that seemed to be where i was noticing some struggles with mine during the winter time when i had them indoors was when the humidity got below 50 and it was more on 40 to 43 there was started to be some tip burn there's also a lot of airflow in there so that's something to account for and uh, the lighting on these does seem to vary so when you read about the plant online most of the information says that they're a low light plant which they are they're a fern right a lot of the ferns that we grow indoors are low light ferns but i did notice the best growth out of these when they were more close to the grow lights getting pretty bright light not super intense i would like if this were outdoors call it a part sun to part shade filtered in the afternoon of course indoors any eastern western northern facing window would be fine for the plant where they're going to get morning or late afternoon sun just not anything that's going to be on them for too terribly long and burn those leaves up but we want to avoid with the ferns don't want to burn the foliage up don't want to let them dry out too long and don't over fertilize them quarter strength usually does the trick with ferns that so don't need anything stronger than that with ferns most things in general usually come down to the amount of moisture and light they're getting like i said you say that about all house plants right the main thing i've noticed with this one was just to make sure that it didn't dry out for too terribly long this is nowhere near as sensitive as some of the other ferns that i've grown like maiden hair ferns where if they dry out for a second they just blech and wilt down and start to die these they do start to go kind of flaccid and look unhappy it's really easy to tell when they need to be watered ideally they would be watered before that happens but sometimes that's just how we have to learn the rhythm of the plant so there were several occasions where these did wilt down pretty dramatically before they got watered and i made sure to water them from the top and let them sit in a dish for about half an hour to really soak that water up and they always bounce back just fine that probably only happened a couple of times with these plants it didn't happen very often but it is what spurred me to move this one into a self-watering container you see that that's why it's in that tall pot there with the little clear window so it just has a reservoir in the bottom a little wicking cord to draw the water up to the top that's because i had this one sitting in a spot in my grow space during the winter time where the airflow from my heater was much 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 stronger and really just pounding not right on it but right past it like somewhere over here it was making it difficult to keep the plant hydrated but i wanted the plant in that spot for the filming for the camera angles 
that was a little bit selfish there, but I made it work. Put it in a self-watering container, no problems after that. And then this one over here to the right of that one, I've really just been growing it like a typical house plant. I haven't been doing anything special with it, it's making sure that it gets its water, its quarter strength fertilizer, keep the old stuff pruned off of it. And uh, that's about it. Check it for bugs and pests. Otherwise, it's been pretty happy. Seemingly, no matter what I do with it, it they just they seem happy. As long as they stay watered, they can't seem to do anything wrong with them. I wouldn't leave them in this kind of sun all day long. This is just because it's early morning. I'm filming the video and want to make sure that they were lit up nicely. But typically, I would like the light to be filtered. Something above them when they're outdoors or even indoors. I don't know why you couldn't put these in a southern exposure room as long as they're several feet back from the window. I think that that would be totally fine, even though they're considered a low light plant. What is that? What does that really mean? Typically, our low light plants when we have in the house are getting nowhere near enough light to grow and thrive. Maybe they'll survive, but surviving and thriving, not the same thing. They can take a good amount of light as long as it's not on them directly, especially magnified through a window for multiple hours at a time. Scoot them a few feet back, have some sheer curtains or something like that hanging up if it's a southern exposure. That's where that afternoon light comes through and blazes on them, just cooks them up. And as far as fertilizing, well, that's not going to be a great visual. It's t this thing's kind of torn up, isn't it? I just use an all-purpose fertilizer. With this applicator, if you just dial it down to here, it switches it to being a quarter strength. So when I get to my ferns, I just dial it down. Yeah, I know it's, it's old and not looking rough. They don't make this one anymore, though, so I'm not getting rid of it all-purpose fertilizer. I'm not using anything spectacularly crazy with them. Sometimes they get some seaweed fertilizer and in the spring they got a top dressing with some earthworm castings. Again in July they got another top dressing with some earthworm castings and in about a week or two they're going to get some more. I like earthworm castings. It's a nice gentle organic fertilizer. Gentle source of nitrogen and whatnot. The plants just seem to enjoy it, especially for plants that are more delicate like the ferns, helps keep that nice, rich environment down around those roots, especially since, you know, they're potted plants. When you water them, the nutrients tend to flush out more quickly, so it's good to add those things back in every so often. Organic fertilizers don't work instantly. That's important to remember, right? If I put earthworm castings in there back in early spring, I'll say probably that was maybe mid-April when these got their first top dressing with those earthworm castings, this probably didn't break down and start to do much up until May and then so forth. So whatever they get takes a while to start breaking down and then it's good for a little while, but then you gotta keep, gotta keep feeding all those microbes that you're building down there to help get the nitrogen and stuff moving around the soil. That's kind of off to a different topic, but that's why I apply those earthworm castings every few months is to make sure that that source of nitrogen keeps being fed to all the good stuff down there that's breaking it down that helps get all the good stuff going around those roots so that they can get the nitrogen and all the minerals that they need. The uh, fronds on these, that was, I guess I probably should talk about the appearance of the plant and all the reasons that it's pretty before my experience with growing it, but they're right in front of the camera. So I just, do I need to describe it that much? All right, well, other than it just being a fairly easy fern to grow, especially for being a fern that will grow a trunk on them, I really just think they're nice looking. They have that typical pinnate, which you would see leaf structure that you get on a fern. It, it's just green. Okay, so as I try and describe it, I look at it and go, okay, it's just a green leaf, but there's some intricacy in here. When you look at these leaves up close, you can see these really kind of fine little ripples. They have a rippled sort of wave texture to each one of these leaflets that come off there, which I really enjoy. Ferns, we grow them for their lushness, right? I think when everybody sees a fern, that's one thing we all have in common. We go, oh, it's so green, it's so lush. There's just something refreshing about a fern. And then when you add in little details like that, and it's not just a flat leaf, which on most ferns, it's not just a flat leaf. There's usually something special going on if you look close enough. It gives you more shadows and more textures. So you can see it, more colors. It just makes the plant look more lush. I think the main reason we grow this plant, though, isn't because of those fine little details. It's because they grow a trunk and they just look cool. They take some time to get their trunk going. The thicker you want the trunk, the more light you're going to want to give the plant so you have nice stout growth. And it, give it a few years and they'll start to thicken out and climb up again. Not speaking from experience on that one. That is an important thing to note here. That's just what I've been told by other people. This is where the comment section comes in really handy. It's also why I'm not calling this a care video. This is a it's an update and here's what I've been doing with them. Here's what's worked, what hasn't worked. 
and uh, what I've been told. And I want to make sure y'all know when it's something that I've just been told and not something that I know off of firsthand. But that does make sense. That's how things work with a lot of tree ferns. Not unusual for them to take a moment to get going with those trunks. Generally, those root structures have to build up nice and strong inside those containers. It takes a few years and then boom, you start having the growth that builds upon all the old growth and you get a trunk. I have also really liked the way the old foliage ages out on these. I already pruned this one up. It had a lot of junky stuff on it that I cut off right before I started filming the video, but I left these on so you can have a nice look at them. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, we want to see lush greenness on our plants, obviously, but if they're going to die off, it's, it's nice at least when it looks pretty. There's some good color in there. This is all old stuff that's been trapped in that plant since we had a heat spell back in July that just fried my backyard. This dark pavement out here, it's kind of like a frying pan. So they didn't appreciate that. That's probably an important thing to note. When things got up into the triple digits and there wasn't much humidity, these did not do very well. They didn't die though. Got lots of new growth out of them, but they lost a lot of their foliage when things got absolutely bone dry out here. Camera overheated, random change of background, and now things are backlit, but hey, at least the camera's not going to cook in the sun. As I was saying, speaking of cooking in the sun, the issue I had with these, the biggest issue was back in July when we had triple digit temperatures and very low humidity, which is not normal for my area. Triple digit temperatures in July happen. That's not unusual. The low humidity, no, that was, that was new for me. I'm not used to having to deal with all that mess. Ferns, nope, they, they did not appreciate it. So there was almost total die off with the foliage on these, but kept them hydrated, moved them into more shade, and eventually they flushed back. I mean, you can see they, they did okay. They've recovered, but there was a lot to cut out from a lot of stuff cooked inside of there. In the future, if we have a forecast like that, I will move these plants into the house because I'd, I would think it'd be better for them to just not go through that. That horrible heat spell we had that was really bad though, I wasn't home to move them in the house, so. Oops. Yet another example, though, of why these are such great ferns. They're pretty resilient. I'm, I guess when you think about the Australian tree ferns, they, you can put those through a fair amount and they'll normally recover. Not always with the most vigor. You know, people cut the tops off those things and chop them into logs to ship them around. And you never really get the same nice growth out of them that you would have if you didn't completely remove all the foliage from the top. But they're still sturdy enough plants that they come back. I'm not making that claim for these. I'm not saying you should chop the foliage off and just assume that they're going to be okay. That's not the case. But they have been through some adversity, which is why we're here and why we're talking about them. I think that that's what helps people learn how to grow something the most is to hear about what other people have dealt with with the plants, what those plants have been through, how they recovered from it. And here we are. What I've learned to move forward. So I got distracted by the dog playing with some toys and making noise. They're mostly fairly common sense things when it comes to growing a house plant. Even if it's a fern, things like we'll make sure that the 10,000 watt heater doesn't have a blast of air shooting right around the plant. Duh. That never should have been a thing to begin with. I didn't realize that air that was coming out of the heater was so strong. It, that was my first year with that heater. There was a learning curve. Had to change some things up. Also, triple digit temperatures and low humidity, just, I'm just gonna move the plants inside. If it's going to be ongoing, and I for some reason didn't want the plant inside, then I'd move it into the deep shade where my sprinklers are going to hit them multiple times a day and make sure that they are surrounded by lots of other plants or at least some soil, not just sitting on pavement or gravel, something that's going to help re-release some moisture to help keep the air around them nice and humid because they really do need that. The humidity is the other big thing Thing with these. I live someplace with a drier climate, then I think it would be really beneficial for these plants to have them surrounded by other moisture loving plants that would want similar conditions. That's important if they're all going to be hanging out together, right? So spathophyllums, maybe some diphenbachias, pothos, plants that are going to be good with the moisture and don't need a ton of light. That way you have lots of moist soil around them, you have lots of transpiration, moisture coming out from the foliage, and they can all just help each other stay nice and moist. I think that would work out well. Just seeing the foliage, we all know that's basically a waste of time at this point, right? It, once it evaporates, it's not doing much. Having moist soil or a big tray of water underneath them with some pebbles to separate the bottom of the pot from that water, you don't want it sitting directly in that water. 
but lift it above that water, that will release moisture for a much longer amount of time than just having little tiny water droplets on the leaves that just, they, they don't do much. Temporarily, they do a little, and I mean, they make the plant look nice, and there's something satisfying about misting a plant, so I get it. But that can also lead to other issues with fungal and different types of infections and things that can end up growing on the plants that really, in the long run, be easier to just not have to deal with those things. So unless you have a lot of humidity and good airflow, I, w I would just steer clear of the misting method. I don't think they need that. Not indoors, outdoors, whatever. As long as there's good airflow, it's okay. That water will evaporate quickly. The plants should be fine. Don't have much to say about cold tolerance. I've never tested them for it. I like to do that with a lot of my plants. I don't know if I'll be doing that with these, at least not for a few more years. I'd like for them to be larger and more established. It did get down to 47 here last night, which is kind of unusual for this time of year, but it happened. They don't seem to have cared about it, but that's something cold damage. It can take a long time to actually see the effects. Sometimes, not always, it's, sometimes it's very visible right away, but sometimes with palms and other things that have a trunk that could be damaged from the inside, it can take a while. I know these aren't palms, but things with monopodial growth, that's just been my experience. And sometimes the problem can be like down here and you're not gonna see it until things start to grow up from the top. It doesn't matter. I would imagine these are good into any environment that is frost free if you wanna grow them as a perennial. I think they're listed as a zone 10 and up, so that would be above 50 during the winter time, never dropping below that. But I, from everywhere I've seen these being grown online, the, a lot of people are growing these in places that are not zone 10. I would think that as long as you just don't have frost, that should be good enough for the plant. But there are lots of variables to keep in mind. There's maybe keep the plant above 40 or 45, just to be safe. The cooler it gets, the higher the risk are for infections, for different types of rot and problems with the plants. It's not always just about what is being damaged, like structurally of the plant by the cold, just rupturing cells from things freezing, but the problems that can arise from stalled growth that you get with those cold temperatures and just stagnant water and other icky stuff that goes on inside the soil and around the base of the plants. These have a good amount of roots coming out the bottom and things are feeling fairly firm in here. With ferns, the pot should never feel rock solid from the roots. If that's the case, then they're way overdue for a repot. These are ready to be repotted. When I repot them, I'm just going to barely bump them up in size, just a teeny, tiny bit. I've noticed with ferns, just talking about ferns in general, not necessarily specifically this one right here, the silver lady fern. If that were in focus, it would be absolutely beautiful, wouldn't it? Anyways, mush, muster. moisture is such an important part of growing these plants. If you have too much new soil on the outside, it can be a challenge getting them established. So I like to just barely bump them up each time. So there's just a little bit of fresh soil on the outside for them to work their way up into. It doesn't need to be a drastic like two to three inch on the outside. I would say I'm probably, I'm gonna try and if I can find a pot that's the right size, just maybe half an inch on the outside diameter. That's, that's it. Just a small amount of fresh soil at a time, barely bumping it out so that there's not constantly moisture moving away from the root ball. When ferns get overpotted, that tends to be when things can get problematic because they end up having to water them so heavily to keep them hydrated because that water's moving away. Path of least resistance is going to be the soil that doesn't have any roots in it, right? The fresh soil that's draining faster. And then you end up dealing with root rot, which that's never fun. When I bump them up, I'll be using probably just an all-purpose potty mix, an organically rich blend that drains well, but not so well that the soil dries out too quickly because, you know, the ferns, they don't like that. Comment down below what have been your experiences growing the dwarf tree fern, specifically the Blechnum gibbum. There are some other dwarf tree ferns. That is a broad, common name. There's the Brazilian sea. That's one other type that has more colorful foliage on it. Don't have much experience with that one other than that I have killed one, <laughs> but uh, that's about as much as I could tell you with that one. It didn't do well. They never really gave that plant the TLC it needed to bounce back from some bad conditions it had when it was shipped. It was really cold when it got shipped out. As far as ferns go, these are up there as being some of my favorites. I cannot wait until they start to trunk out. They have something going on down low. I wouldn't call it a trunk. They're not there yet. They should only get about three to four feet high in my climate. I can't imagine as a house plant they'll ever get any bigger than that, but 
Maybe. We will see. I would be shocked, though. That's, that'll be many, many, many years down the road. Like, anyway, it's time to go. Like I said, comment down below. Tips, tricks, suggestions, always appreciated. Check out the comment sections, how we all learn and grow together, especially since this is just an update. Here's what I've been doing, what I would change. You heard all of it. Hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life. Come on, camera. Get in focus. And everything's just going beautifully for you. Oh, that looks nice. Ferns, just love them. They're so pretty, so tranquil. And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.